We welcome Ron Lieber, author of The Price You Pay for College, an entirely new roadmap for the biggest financial decision your family will ever make. Ron is also the Your Money columnist for the New York Times. But the reason we really love Ron is that 403BYs is a nonprofit in large part because of a series of articles on the K-12 403B he and colleague Tara Siegel Bernard wrote in 2016. Welcome, Ron. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Oh my gosh, Ron, just real quick on that story about the New York Times articles. Uh, you know, Tim Ranzetta, the uh, co-founder of Next Gen Personal Finance, reads those and reaches out to Scott and I because of that. So Ron, thank you again for that. Uh, sure. I mean, you don't have to thank me. Uh, it was, uh, you know, an honor to do that work. And it was just astounding to us uh, to find uh, just how troubling and troublesome these 403B plans were. It was almost like there was some alternative universe that existed um, where rules didn't matter, uh, regulations didn't exist, um, and the people who do some of the most important work in society were uh, essentially being taken advantage of for no good reason that we could find. So, uh, you know, it was our honor and really our duty to do the work. Uh, well, thank you. And I want you to know those stories have legs. They're constantly still being shared in our community and read. So again, thank you so much. Well, let's move to your book on college. Ron, I am completely in awe of this book. I felt like I was back in grad school. I have got so many like like underlinings and circlings and it's just, it is just, it is a tour de force. I seriously think we could do a podcast on each of the 35 chapters. Are you up for that, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I do do some public speaking on the topic and the last book I did six years ago about kids and money and how to talk to kids about money and what to say when you do, that live show from that book was really only an hour, right? There was an hour of really substantive and important things to say, but I could kind of get it done in an hour. With this book, it's like three or four hours. I mean, it's just that big of a number and there's just that much confusion and there are just that many elements to reckon with. And so, I, you know, the, all those underlines are the highest compliment you can pay. And so I, I'm glad that it was useful. It's not just the the depth of the material and the information for parents and students. It's the quality of your writing, Ron. This book was so readable. So thank you too for making it so accessible. I appreciate that. I work pretty hard to get the tone right. I mean, the content is one thing, but I, you know, I've been working on the content for what seems like decades now and lived mm -hmm. some of it myself, you know, back in the late 80s and early 90s, albeit in a very different era. Um, but the tone is harder. So I appreciate that. Oh, that's great. Okay, let's dive into the content of the book. First of all, why did you write this book? Well, there were a couple things going on. I mean, certainly it was personal, right? I have a 15-year-old and a five-year-old. And so I knew right away when the first one was born that through the you know basic power of, of compound interest, it was going to you know do us some good to save as much as we could as early as we could um, for this kid's education. But it was clear that tuition inflation was proceeding a pace such that you know if we wanted to send her to a private college someday, it might cost close to four hundred thousand dollars, four hundred fifty thousand dollars. We couldn't quite tell. Um, and if we wanted to have another kid, I. You know, for people with, with, with two single digit age kids today, there's a pretty good chance that if they pay full freight at a private college, so, you know, big caveats and asterisks there, that they'll be on the hook for a million bucks after taxes. Um, it was just astounding, right? So I was freaking out uh, in anticipation of that. Um, my wife and I are both journalists. Um, we make good livings for journalists, but we weren't just going to be able to like go around writing half a million dollar checks, right? Uh, it was something that we had to plan for, not just for years, but for decades, right? And then, you know, professionally, I start writing about some of this stuff. And I write some about saving for college and I write some about paying for college and student loans and all of the issues around that. But what started to happen a couple of years ago was that my inbox at the New York Times started to fill up with both people who knew me um, and readers who thought that they knew me who were saying a couple different things. They were saying, Ron, we've been reading all the stuff that you've been writing and 
here's the situation that we're in, right? Um, the kid has gotten into the University of Texas at Austin, right? Wonder of wonder, miracle of miracles, flagship state university, one of the best in the country. Um, they've also gotten into SMU in Dallas, right? Great private university, offers some of what's become known as merit aid, right? So it's a you know quasi-academic scholarship that's based more on what you have done and who you are and less about the amount of money that you have. And then my kid also shot the lights out and they got into rice. And our household earns $250,000 a year. Lucky us, right? A, 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 an orchestra of small violins should play in sympathy for our financial <laughs> circumstance. But at $250,000, we can't write $75,000 checks each year to rice. And rice is not going to give us any need-based financial aid. So UT Austin is going to cost $100,000 or so. SMU is going to cost two hundred. dollars Rice is going to cost three hundred. dollars Where in your big bag of big data is the data set that will tell us whether rice is $200,000 better than UT? And I thought, wow, uh, that data doesn't exist. And the more I thought about it, I realized that data doesn't exist because the schools like it that way. They want us making decisions on the basis of emotion and not on the basis of data or facts. And so what I realized was that I'd been asking the wrong question all along. I mean, sure, it was important to think about how to save for college and how to pay for college. But what these readers were asking me, they were asking me a value question. They were asking what to pay for college. And as soon as I reframed it for myself that way, I knew there was no way to answer that question in anything less than a book. Wow. And I feel like you have answered it. Um, I think this ties into a point you just touched on. You write, what else do you buy where you don't know the price until you've already limited your choices? Can you elaborate on this idea? Uh, yeah, it's completely bonkers, right? So here's the problem, um, the challenge, but it's also a problem. What we've got here in higher education is something with a six-figure list price, right? It'll probably cost you close to $100,000 to get through you know, your flagship state university if you're not living at home and you don't get any financial aid or other discounts, right? So it's you know, $100,000 at the baseline level, 325, 350 to you know, go to Rice or Stanford or, or Cornell or whatever if your kid is starting today, uh, if you're paying the full price. So that's the full price, number one. Number two are the discounts relating to financial need, right? So if you can demonstrate that you qualify for financial aid on the basis of your income and your assets, and the school has aid available to give you, right? Those may be two different things, right? Then there's that, so there's that second track, need-based aid. Um, and then there is the third track, which is this merit aid that we talked about before, which is, um, you know, based on, who your kid is, what your kid has done, and, and how much the school wants a, a kid like yours, and how desperate the school is to you know, discount effectively to a price that will be appealing to your family. Um, so you know, this is where the confusion lies at the outset, right? Um, you don't always know ahead of time until you have artificially constrained your choices by choosing where to apply what it is that you'll pay because the school doesn't make you an official offer on that merit aid stuff or on that need based aid stuff until after you've all already applied. Um, so you only get as many offers, unless you're willing to pay full price, you only get as many discount offers as the applications you put in. So how messed up is that, right? I mean, this is arguably the biggest financial decision that most families will ever make. And yet we've got to constrain our choices through a limited number of applications before we even get a price quote, right? As messed up as the auto industry is, particularly right now with all these people having to pay over the, the manufacturer's listed price, um, at least you can go around and you know talk to as many auto dealers as you want. That's not how it works in higher education. And that's totally messed up. Isn't that kind of ironic that it, you go to school, you, you kind of go to higher ed to sharpen and learn critical thinking skills and uh, to make decisions based on data and facts. And yet it, that entire institution's pitch to you is, we're not gonna give you the data and facts. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, it's even worse than that, right? Because think about the amount of statistical 
and investigatory brain power that is housed at these institutions. Think about the sheer capacity for generating knowledge and research around everything from how much people learn to what is the best way for them to learn to the economic uh, impact of attending school and the different impacts of you know, pursuing this extracurricular activity versus that one or living on campus or off and how that relates to GPA and your socioeconomic background and whether you're black or whether you're not black. And, you know, all of this stuff is there to be um, turned into data and mined and converted to more effective um, blueprints for who should come at what age, in what way, at what price. And the colleges don't want anything to do with it, right? Because if we have more data, we have more equations and algorithms that help us figure out how not to overpay. We have 10 more US News and World Report type surveys, except with even better data. And then we have more discerning consumers, right? And then we have people making decisions more on the basis of reason as opposed to emotion. And that's not really in the interest of the school. Huh. So where do where do people start? I mean, when it comes to researching, how where do you start? I mean, I know a lot of kids start with these are the colleges I want to go to, but I mean, you know, a, a lot of times they're just they're not going to get into them, or even if they do, they can't afford. Where do you start this process? Where do parents and students start this process? I mean, I don't know, Scott. Like, I, I hate to get all existential on you, but <laughs> what is college? Right? It's, it's actually not a rhetorical question. College is different things to different people. Not everybody should go to college. Not everybody should go to college at age 18. And if you wait a couple of years after high school to go to college, um, college may mean something very different to you than it would at age 18, which is part of the point of waiting, right? College is actually wasted, in my humble opinion, on the majority of 18-year-olds. That's a topic for another day in a book that I actually wrote back in 1996 called Taking Time Off, um, which encouraged people to take gap years, right? But that aside, right, you got to figure out what college is for. So what is college for? I, you know, I asked this question to every family that I encountered while I was reporting the price you pay for college. And often they looked at me um, sort of befuddled, but you know, eventually I nudged them uh, or elbowed them in the ribs enough until they sort of coughed up an answer. And what I heard was three different things. I heard the college is for the education, right? It is for the pure um, love and value of stuffing your brain um, with relative facts and interesting ideas and ways in which to approach the world that you might not have considered yourself, right? Um, college is about having your mind grown and your mind blow. So that's number one. Number two, college is about the kinship, right? It is about those mind-blowing teachers and instructors and deans and clergy members and dorm assistants and financial aid officers, basically any grown-up you can find and make your friend and make your mentor, right? So there's the kinship there from the grown-ups who can help. And then there's the other people who are your age who will all be becoming grown-up uh, at the same time that you are in the same place in the same way, right? You are looking for the peers who will lift you up and enlighten you and carry you through life. Um, so it's about the friends uh, that you make along the way and the people who will become the beginnings of not just your social network, but your career network. So that's number two, the kinship. And then number three is the credential. And that may be, you know, the BSN that allows you to become a nurse and, and maybe, um, you know, take a leap up the social class ladder from where you started. It may be the bachelor's in biology that allows you to go to medical school. Um, it could be, uh, you know, the accounting degree that, you know, gets you started in a degree in, uh, in, a, um, in a career that's relatively stable. Um, or it may be some kind of gold-plated credential, right? Rice, you know, as opposed to SMU that you believe rightly or wrongly can open doors uh, for yourself um, to places, careers, industries, companies, opportunities that you would not have been able um, to find your way to through your own family's connections, whatever they may be, right? Um, so that is what makes people quite often and sometimes rightfully um, pay much more uh, to go to a private university than a public one, right? So those are the three reasons to go to college. Um, 
it's possible that only one of those applies to you and your family. It's, a possible, it's possible that all three apply. And it's possible that all three apply, but not in equal measure. So before you can even start making a list for yourself, you've got to figure out what college is for, right? Before you even start thinking about the money side of this, you've got to figure out what it is that you're actually valuing in the first place. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's like a, that's the, the most deep ex explanation I've heard of uh, you know, why you should go to college. I mean, I was Thank the you. first. <laughs> it was very. It makes me now. Uh, so I have a son in college. He's uh, he's starting his junior year, which it'll be the uh, his his first junior year. He's he's switched majors. I think what a lot of people don't realize is you know, we're asking seventeen year olds to make decisions about their entire career at seventeen and. 18 and like, what the heck? They don't know what they want to do, even when they think they know what they want to do. You know, um, my son changed his major like four times and, and which means that it's not going to be four years. Um, so for a number of different reasons, it's, it's not always going to be four years. One, maybe you can't get the classes. Two, you change your major once and you're off schedule. Um, so suddenly you're going to the, to the summers. Um, but you said something about this book taking time off and you said college is lost on 18 year olds. Um, maybe not all of them, but I, this seems to be, this seems to be a, an idea that is gaining steam and, and maybe a lot of people took it off last year, but the idea of taking a gap year and really all of the stuff that you just talked about, figuring it out. Why are you going? What are the reasons you're going? What are your values? What do you value? It, should this become more common? Should this be something we encourage our kids to do? And it, what are the pros and cons to that? It's absolutely something that we should consider our kid. We should, we should ask our kids to consider. And, and I take your point on how difficult it can be for your average 16 or 17 year old to even answer these questions, given how limited, like physically limited, particularly in the last year and a half, how limited their worldview may be. You know, they haven't seen much or done much or been exposed to much. Uh, so how can we expect them to, you know, answer these like semi-existential questions about the meaning of life and the meaning of work and, you know, what might make them happy? We can't, which is the precisely the reason why they shouldn't be going to college and spending all of this money at the age of, at the age of 18 to figure it out. And by the way, there is like no knock on, on you for having sent your kid away or for your son for having changed his mind. That is exactly what they're yeah. supposed to be doing. That's right. the point, right? Go out and see stuff and figure out what turns you on and what bores you to tears and then have the guts to pivot, right? But the problem is we're charging 25 to 70 Five thousand dollars a year for this for this you know period of ex of exposure, and maybe it's worth it in certain circumstances. But for most eighteen year olds, I think it might be possible that the majority of them, although not all of them, or certainly a, a large minority, should just go do something else for a while that doesn't cost a thing or actually get paid, right? Um, you know, go find some job that doesn't require a college degree and do that for a year and see some of the world and have some real experiences and then bring that experience back to bear on the application process or the college attendance process when you know yourself a little bit better. Well, I'm kicking myself now for not reading Taking Time Off uh, prior, to <laughs> prior to sending my kid away. Um, but like, you know, he, he went with a major in mind and then it wasn't what he thought it was going to be. And I just said, listen, man, just take classes that you think are interesting and find one and find something that you like and take as many diverse classes as you can. The problem with that advice is that it, it takes you off this, you got to graduate in four, which I don't care. If you, it take five years, take six years, fine. The problem is that fifth year, that six year costs a ton of extra money. And that's where like, um, so now I, I think that's where this taking time off might help alleviate the, maybe, I don't know, I got no data on that, but the idea of, you know, maybe you can finish in four, if you take a year off, it might actually be saving you money. Um, so the, 
I, I know you have a lot of sympathy for parents. You mentioned the fear and, and guilt that many feel. What message do you have for, for parents? So I'm glad you mentioned those feelings because one of the things that we as parents need to do during this process, aside you know, from the standard financial planning stuff, which you guys know so well around you know, saving and returns and avoiding taxes and all the rest of it, is that we need to do a sort of emotional audit of ourselves as parents um, to make sure that we are not bringing too much baggage to the table. And this is almost impossible to avoid. Uh, you know, feelings as ever are a huge part of personal finance, right? Um, and so what are the feelings that are most likely to intervene and interfere in a way that can be counterproductive? Well, there's guilt, right? Guilt that we don't earn enough, guilt that we haven't saved enough, guilt that we may have the ability to pay, but that we lack the willingness in certain instances or for certain institutions, and we don't know how to explain that to our kids, or we're totally willing to explain it, but um, don't like it when they burst into tears when we do, right? Um, guilt that we're not doing what our parents did for us, guilt that our parents did nothing for us, but we can't do everything for our kids, which was our goal, right? There's just so many ways to send yourself on a guilt trip. And so I'm just trying to bring people back from those itineraries. It's counterproductive and it can cause you to spend and borrow more than you need. So that's guilt. Then there's fear, right? Fear that if you make the wrong choice, that if you don't spend enough, that if you don't borrow enough, that if you don't do precisely what it is that your kid um, it, you know, wants you to do, that your child will go tumbling down the social class ladder from wherever it is that you've managed to scramble up to, or maybe you were born um, with a silver spoon in your mouth and uh, you, know, you can't bear the idea uh, that your kid is gonna be upper middle class instead of you know, in the 1% and you're trying to erect some kind of um, you know, concrete barrier below which your child cannot possibly fall. And you're trying to do that through the payment of tuition, which is no insurance policy at all. Right. So right. please, you know, get over um, the fear if you possibly can and um, realize that um, there just are there just no are no guarantees. Um, and then the other emotion um, that um, is the one that parents are often least um, willing to admit to is snobbery. Right. And elitism. All right. Private is better than public. Um, you know, uh, the more expensive is better than less expensive. Um, and, you know, we get all caught up in how it is that we might sound or it might sound when we go around, you know, the neighborhood or the community telling people what our kid is doing, um, particularly if we happen to go to a more selective institution ourselves or happen to go to institution that didn't used to be selective at all, like Northeastern, which now only accepts like a teen percentage of the people who apply, right? And so, you know, we want our kids to have what we had and we're worried about how it looks that like it, they don't do what we did or they don't, you know, achieve what we have achieved without stopping to account for just how much more uh, academically competitive and financially competitive and how like utterly rejective many of these institutions have become, right? So um, look deep inside of yourself. Um, it's okay to be a snob sometimes. Um, sometimes it's good to be elitist, right? Um, but just be emotionally honest with yourself, um, with your spouse, if you have one, with your ex, especially if you've got one of those, um, do the best that you can to be emotionally honest about all of this. Rod, you, it's almost like you're reading our script. Our next question was about the pull of school snobbery and elitism. So I'm glad you uh, touched on that. You also have a chapter called The Special Power of Women's Colleges. Can you share some highlights from that section? Sure. I, I mean, we, you know, we begin with um, well, well, let me just sort of state the thesis from the outset, which is that there's some incredible values out there uh, in women's colleges, and here's why. Um, first of all, let, you know, let's begin with the given that um, sexism exists. Um, it exists in undergraduate education, um, and there are sometimes, I 
don't know if I would say often, but certainly sometimes and, and, and maybe often, you know, sexism that exists in the classroom. Um, there are um, real biases and um, unconscious biases, uh, particularly in um, the STEM degrees and in the STEM programs that can make undergraduate women feel uncomfortable or cause them to be at uh, an actual disadvantage, right? Um, and what the data has shown again and again is that uh, young women tend to persist uh, with STEM degrees in particular and uh, you know, achieve that bachelor's degree and go on to grad school at you know, higher per percentages with higher odds uh, than they would at um, institutions that have both men and women uh, at them, right? Um, and, so, uh, and so where does the value come in? Well, if you are running a women's college, and trying to attract students, um, half the population is off limits from the get-go. Um, and then among the young women that might consider you, a pretty large percentage of them want nothing to do with a single sex institution, right? So there's a relatively limited pool of candidates. So what does that mean? Well, even some of the very best women's colleges in America, like Smith and Mount Holyoke, they need to throw discount money at affluent families just to get the kids to come. Right, they're they're using the so-called merit aid to try and fill their classes, particularly, um, you know, at Smith with a young woman who they might buy away from Amherst or Williams or Mount Holyoke with someone they might try and you know buy away from Connecticut College or or Hamilton, um, and so even if you earn a million dollars a year, uh, your kid at Smith College might be offered twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars off per year. Right. That's real money, particularly for um, an education uh, that is super high octane and may in fact be uh, advantageous for a young woman, a young woman in science in particular. Yeah, that whole section and what you just described, you know, to me was, wow, here's a chance where the tables get turned a little bit more in the favor of the family. Again, if you are someone who wants to go to that kind of institution. Um, I was also struck by your section on the College of Wooster. What makes that university so unique? So when I went out to report the price you pay for college, I had I was act, trying to act against a sort of you know personal bias of, of familiarity and also make a point. So you know my personal bias of familiarity was that I was just you know more familiar and had set foot on more you know West Coast and East Coast campuses than I had um, in colleges in the middle of the country. And also, it was my general sense at the beginning of the reporting that Midwestern institutions, particularly smaller ones, were undervalued, right? Mm -hmm. They weren't necessarily under-resourced. I mean, Grinnell College in Iowa has one of the highest endowments per student like on the face of the planet. Um, they have a ton of money to throw around, but because they're in the middle of Iowa, they have to give you know, merit aid discounts to rich kids just to get enough people to come, right? So I wanted to you know, do a bunch of reporting at places that I'd never been to before in the middle of the country. So I spent a lot of time in Ohio, a lot of time in Minnesota, um, a lot of time at you know, smaller, lesser known schools there, just trying to figure out what was what. Um, and then, right, in a world where an undergraduate education can feel like a commodity, um, and where the pricing structure is extremely problematic and opaque. I wanted to find a school that was sort of doing right by consumers on the front end and then delivering something that felt um, relatively unique, if not completely singular. And so the College of Worcester and Worcester, Ohio checked both those boxes off for me. Um, and it did it for two reasons. First of all, on the front end, Unlike almost any other school uh, in America that you know offers this this merit aid hoo ha of of its caliber of the school's quality, right? Um, you can call the College of Worcester up, you know, in August or September, and ask for what's known as a merit aid pre read, right? So you go to them and you say. Uh, okay, you know, here are the SAT or ACT scores, here, if I have them, here's the GPA, um, here's my family's financial circumstances. If I were to be admitted, about what would the price be, right? And they'll give you a quote that they'll more or less stand by if you manage to get in, right? So that avoids the whole problem we were talking about before where you have no idea, literally within six figures, right? What this thing might cost over four years. They'll essentially give you a quote upfront if you're interested enough to take them up on it. So College of Worcester will do that. Whitman College in Washington will do that. Very few, if any others, 
do it. Um, and so I like that. Um, and the other thing that goes on on Worcester uh, that I thought was really cool was that the whole undergraduate experience academically um, culminates with what's essentially a mandatory senior thesis, but they, they refer to it by a different name, independent study. Everybody does one. You work with a faculty member one-on-one -on -one in some or another department or via some you know, interdisciplinary arrangement that you can propose yourself. And over the course of a year, you produce a, um, a, a work. Um, it's a, it could be a work of art. It can be a concert performance. It can be uh, a novel. It can be a kind of more standard 100-page academic paper, um, a work of scientific inquiry. Everybody does it. Um, the whole academic experience is built around it. There are very few institutions um, other than Princeton that do anything like it on an undergraduate level. And then when it's all done, they throw this like Woodstock thing on campus at the end of April. And I got to go see one one year and it was just the coolest thing. I mean, you just wander around campus all day long you know, gaping at 25 foot murals that, you know, people spent nine months on or going to a concert where, um, you know, this one guy, Jeremy Smucker, uh, he had unrelated to the jam and jelly fortune, by the way, um, <laughs> um, Mr. Smucker uh, took the words from, you know, that year's poet Laura um, and, and set them to song and wrote an entire song cycle and then sang the songs in like the school's concert hall. And then that afternoon, he did a presentation about his economics independent study. So he did two of them, right? Um, just stuff like that all day long. And the parents come and alumni come back and I had never seen anything like it. And they don't do that at Princeton. They don't celebrate the, the undergraduate works in that way. And I thought, all right, you know, um, here's something that's, that's different, that stands out, that's singular. Um, most people don't pay full price to go to Worcester, even if they are uh, affluent. Um, and so it felt to me like there was some, some value and some distinctiveness there that deserves to be called out, not because everybody should go to College of Worcester, lots of people should not go to College of Worcester, but because all of us should demand that um, level of distinctiveness and clarity from any institution that has the temerity to ask for $300,000 or something close to it. Well, I was gonna ask, do you know, as a result of your book, if interest in applications to Worcester have, uh, you know, increased, or is that hard to say? I, I don't know. And frankly, it makes me a, a little uncomfortable to ask because yeah. I wasn't shining a light on them because I was trying to affect a particular result. Um, I mean, it occurred to me that if people bought the book, it, you know, it might make a difference, um, you know, to who goes there, who considers it. Um, and that's not a bad result because I, I believe in what they do there. Um, but I guess I, I, I'm not in this so much to try and move some or another needle statistically, um, quantitatively. I'm in this for qualitative impact. I want people asking better questions and the result of that or the, the prevalence of that isn't something that can easily be measured nationwide. Um, the only thing I have to go on is book sales and I hope people keep buying it. Well, it's definitely on our radar now as a family for our uh, son who's a junior in high school. Um, Ron, why is going the JC route risky? So um, interesting. So by JC, I assume you mean junior college. Yeah. And that's a term that- California term. Us, <laughs> right. Well, many of us of a certain age, um, uh, you know, we're used to using back in the day. Um, you don't hear it much uh, anymore because most people refer to them now as community colleges, two-year institutions, stepping stones in effect. Um, and from a financial strategy standpoint, there are in fact a growing number of families, particularly in California for reasons which we can discuss in a second, um, who make a deliberate st strategic decision uh, to have their kids start at community college and then attempt to transfer at the end of two years. And you know, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, it is always a potentially good idea um, financially because community colleges cost less 
than four-year colleges do. Um, and more often than not, people are uh, commuting to them from home, although not always. Um, and then in states like California that have you know, magnificent um, state university systems, you know, if you wanna get into even the University of California, you know, uh, Irvine or Merced or whatever, you need like a 6.8 grade point average because it's so freaking competitive, right? But if you go and shoot the lights out at community college, you can pretty much guarantee that you're going to get into a UC school. So it's kind of a backdoor from admissions perspective. And there may be some of that in other states as well, particularly for students who have not done very well in high school, um, but want to kind of earn their way into the flagship state university by getting all A's in community college, right? So what's the downside? Well, I'd say the biggest one is that for this strategy to work, you need to actually get done with community college in two years. And that turns out not to be the easiest thing to do all the time in some places under many circumstances, right? So what are those circumstances? Well, first of all, you've got to know what classes you need to get admission to wherever it is that you want to go and have the credits transfer to your intended major so that you're not doing school for five or six years and you're actually doing it for four. Because if you do it for five or six years, it's gonna cost more, you're not saving much by going to community college in the first place. Um, and related to that, you need to be able to get the classes that you need. And at some community colleges, although this has been less of a problem during the pandemic when the populations there have gone down, um, you need to be able to get those classes at community college and they may not fit in with your work schedule, with your commuting schedule, they may not be offered in some semester. And if you don't have your act completely together and you show up for registration, you know, 46 hours after it started, they may be filled, right? And then you're out of luck and you're spending another semester at it. So you've got to have a pretty type A approach um, to making the community college route um, work if your strategy is to save money or to save time or not to lose time. Um, and you know, not every 18 year old has the sort of executive function skills uh, to really stomp on all the details and keep track of all of the rules and requirements. So that's, I think the biggest risk. Well, Ron, as I mentioned at the outset, I could do, a, I think we could do a podcast with every chapter on this book. It's just so detailed and just, uh, just such a quality uh, publication. I've got one last question for you. Um, you actually have a plan for a school for school visits. Can you share what uh, your plan is? And it seems like other parents should emulate that. Yeah, so um, I guess I would start here because our daughter is a rising sophomore in high school. And one of the things that we've decided to do, one, and this is a, an actual financial investment in addition to an investment of time, which you know I understand that there are all sorts of families that either don't have the money or don't have the time, but we're going to choose to use the money and make the time to visit more schools as opposed to fewer and start sooner rather than later. And I totally understand that there are all sorts of people out there who you know, don't want to like bring all this pressure to bear on kids in the first half of their high school career. But to me, college is, you know, important and, and vital and, and, you know, so um, imbued with opportunity that it actually behooves at least our family to start thinking about it a little early, just like, you know, small versus big, right? Urban versus rural, women's colleges, not women's colleges, right? So we want to start poking around and just seeing how these places feel because, particularly during the pandemic, which was its own thing. But I think in general, right, people kind of rush this visiting process. You know, they spend three or four hours at these places and then make a three or $400,000 decision based on literally 200 minutes. I mean, that's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I look, I, I get the financial um, implication of, you know, going on more trips as opposed to fewer, and I get the time requirements. But it just seems like we need to invest in the process as much as we invest in the, um, you know, in, in the destination. Um, so for us, it starts there, um, just being more informed as consumers. Ron, is there any last things you would like our audience to know about your book? I think more than anything, I want 
people to have a larger sense of entitlement about this process. We have grown too used to being supplicants here, whether we are begging for admission to you know, the more rejective colleges and universities, or whether we are begging for need-based financial aid because we don't have enough money to pay full freight, or we're begging for these merit aid discounts that we think we need, even though the school doesn't think we need any money. And I want people to treat this like the consumer decision that it is. It turns out that we have more leverage than we think. And the more informed we are and the more pointed questions that we ask, the better off we will be. Ron, thank you not only for this amazing book, but thank you for all of your excellent work. And thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me.